Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, first event in a series of events called Hydrogen Talk, uh, organized by Hydrogen Europe. And our first question today is, can the Renewable Energy Directive recast, uh, so number two, deliver on the EU's hydrogen ambitions? I'm uh, happy to, uh, in, in very short notice, uh, to uh, see in our program that we uh, can welcome to this question the central person at the moment uh, to deal with it. That's the rapporteur of the European Parliament. As you know, um, the uh, Renewable Energy Directive is part of the Fit for 55 package. And it's um, uh, Markus Pieper, Dr. Markus Pieper, who represents the ITRA committee, the Committee for Industry, Technology, Research and Energy, uh, who today will uh, give us an input uh, on this issue. We are fully aware, uh, Markus, that you need to vote in your committee uh, in, in 20 minutes time. That's why uh, we want to cut it very, very short. I just want to set the scene uh, a little bit and show um, what is at stake. So what is at stake is that in this renewable energy directive package, uh, the commission has set quite ambitious goals so there is a clear target in the so-called refunobios, the renewable fuels of non-biological origin of 2.6 percent. So in 2030, all fuels uh, need to have at least a 2.6 percent part, uh, which is based on hydrogen or derivatives of hydrogen that are some five megatons and more uh, to be produced uh, based on renewables. On the other hand, 50% um, of the nowadays used industrial, in, industrially used hydrogen, uh, which is gray or fossil-based hydrogen, needs to be turned to green or renewably-based hydrogen. In order to get there, we need high capacity of uh, electrolyzers because electrolyzers are the technology that turns water into hydrogen and oxygen based on hopefully renewable power. And that is uh, what we are discussing here today, whether we can achieve that. So far, we have seen announcements and um, Kadri Simpson, the commissioner has uh, also uh, confirmed, uh, we achieve already 50 gigawatt. So that's 10 gigawatt more in 2030 than have been announced. We can achieve these targets with that. 88% of um, the gigafactories on electrolyzers are announced to be built in Europe. That's great. We also have seen that IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, has come up with a report uh, on the geostrategical aspects on, of hydrogen, which uh, was quite, uh, uh, quite interesting and, and, and breathtaking for some of us because it says there's a clear role for hydrogen. And they locate the biggest projects uh, in Europe. The, the very biggest project is the Hydeal project in the north of Spain. Uh, we are very happy that they are, we are cooperating with them very uh, closely. And all this is good. However, what are the factors that could stop this? What are the factors that could help this development? And uh, are we ambitious enough? And what can we think about these delegated acts? Because there is a delegated act which is connected to RED, uh, how to use so to say, grid power for uh, electrolyzer capacity. Uh, and this is something we would like to discuss today. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to uh, Markus Pieper, who is basically an expert in his field. So he represents the biggest group in the European Parliament, uh, the European People's Party. Uh, Markus uh, is uh, MEP since 2004. Um, he is from North Rhine-Westphalia. Uh, and he is also in the Board of Trustees of the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Biomedicine. So he's extremely interested in these uh, kind of fields. Uh, I would like to give you the floor, Marcus, for your uh, key announcement. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks to Giorgio, Chatsi, Markakis and team. Uh, congratulations on the timing and uh, format of this event. 
uh, when people are not allowed to enter football stadiums, they go to Hydrogen Europe's virtual stadiums. Uh, many, many people here, um, 500, 600, impressive. Thank you also for the opportunity to kick off today. Um, hydrogen is part of our energy future. It is now about the framework, the legislative framework conditions. It's about being globally competitive with this energy source and with our energy technologies. And we have a lot of advantages in Europe, an internal market that is the envy of others, an almost unique gas infrastructure, a fully motivated hydrogen um, economy, energy partnerships in the European neighborhood uh, with foreign policy alliances and with recognized uh, human rights policy. We are in a pool position. One third of the global H2 projects are European. And with a Green Deal, we can, Europe, we can make Europe an innovation leader in the race uh, to a climate neutral economy. But we have to do it right. Uh, today's high energy prices are a warning signal. People and economy will only accept an energy transition which is affordable and not an energy transition with a gold rim. The Paris obligation is our compass. Emission trading, ETS, provides the guarantee to keep the CO2 limit. But beyond this, is there too much know-it-all, too much paternalism involved? We shouldn't exaggerate with over-regulation, with political technology specifications. We should listen more to principles of market economy. Neither a politician nor a commission official knows what a startup company needs. The first question must not be what kind of obligations and quotas do we need? That's two, yes, of course. But the first question must be addressed to those who are to implement the Green Deal with market economy. Let's ask the companies in the hydrogen economy first. What is the biggest bottleneck that prevents you from growing? What obstacles do we need to remove for startups so that they open the way to climate neutrality? Then it becomes concrete very quickly. A delegated act with requirements for the production of renewable energy must be an accelerator for startups in Europe and not a fence that stands in the way of the small plants of the hydrogen economy. And really, I do have questions. Why are uh, the old and long time funded wind turbines not allowed to serve H2 production? It's not about additionality first, it's about getting started. Why should the solar or wind power plants be built in the same year as the electrolyzer start producing H2? Okay, the new draft uh, says two years, but I doubt things can be handled in our region as fast as we wish it in Brussels. In any case, we need very flexible requirements for PPA contracts for electrolyzers who have to get some of their electricity from the grid. The new draft seems to respond to this, but next question, why the hourly or new two hourly simultaneous supply of electricity and hydrogen production. Why can't we accept annual balance sheets, at least at the beginning? And why shouldn't we accept a book and claim approach uh, as it is with contracts with green electricity? It is a question of stimulating the quantity of H2 produced in the EU at all and not insisting on physical direct delivery. And why don't have all end use sectors the right to hydrogen? The market should decide on heatings and cars and not politicians and civil servants. These restrictions not only make H2 production in Europe less attractive, with such requirements, we also restrict future imports. Actually, we have global energy partnerships that could be well combined with development assistance not a scorched earth policy as the Chinese often leave behind, no. 
the sustainable European Silk Road for Green Energy must be our goal. So we expect the Commission to answer this question in the Delegated Act on Red 2. And I invite the Commission to ensure that the general acceptance of Delegated Acts keep high. Taxonomy, Red 2, due diligence, union's database, Delegated Acts on the Cascade Principle and Biofuels in Red 3. I have my doubts whether Parliament want to continue to be left out of the picture. Finally, on Red Three, many good guidelines, in particular the ambitious targets for renewables and the obligation uh, to cooperate across borders. This could be even more binding. Uh, this lack of cross-border cooperation is because we make far too little use of the synergies of the internal energy market in, in Europe. And also in the red three, our old problem, there is a tendency away from the simple Paris redu reduction obligation to paternalism that we in Brussels already know what is good for the economy and good for energy prices. In my opinion, also the red three restricts the production of green electricity and bioenergy too much, while at the same time not addressing the need for hydrogen imports. Why not an indicative target for imports as well? Last remark, low carbon solutions. Their importance is hardly taken into account. For me, it's clear we will need also a colored hydrogen for financially affordable energy transition with appropriate admixtures, solutions and regulation that allowed uh, mixed colors and mixed financing. Just as the necessary rollout of electrification would not be possible without part of fossil energy behind the socket, it must be possible for the hydrogen sector to start also with mixtures. I now hear some contradictions in part of the stadium, maybe uh, from the H2 business directly, but back to the beginning. Our benchmark is Paris, and we will set a decisive framework in the next five years. Now we need entrepreneurship, now we need entrepreneurship and all ideas, we need room for it. Climate neutrality will come sooner. We now open the start pragmatically and affordably. If we don't, the Chinese and the Americans will show us with their technologies for transition solutions as well as their innovations for electrolyzers, which they can produce without a lot of restrictions for the production of green hydrogen. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we don't need gold rim solutions and champagne. We need an affordable and fast energy transition. Thank you very much and success for, for your meeting. Many thanks, uh, Markus. Uh, I think that was quite impressive, uh, especially the view of the European Parliament of the Rapporteur on the competitiveness of uh, us Europeans, because we are not alone. Huh? I mentioned the 88% of electrolyzer capacity, uh, and uh, it's not God given that they stay. We will hear later on by uh, those who put take money in, into their hands, private money, to invest how they see it uh, on European but also global scale. Uh, many thanks for your questions uh, to the Commission. I think uh, Ruth Kempener, whom I will uh, introduce later on, uh, did carefully uh, note uh, your questions, and uh, I'm, I'm sure he will answer some of them. But I have the impression, and I, I turn to uh, Jens uh, Geier, so the rapporteur uh, on the hydrogen strategy. So Jens was the one to uh, support uh, or to gather parliament behind him as a rapporteur to support this 40 gigawatt idea in Europe and outside of Europe. And uh, I wonder, Jens, uh, whether uh, you, after uh, you had a fantastic majority <clears throat> behind you uh, supporting this hydrogen strategy, uh, whether you have similar um, ideas about um, the current status quo, because from the strategy um, to now, we have seen uh, two major legislative proposals, the big Fit for 55 package with uh, 3,000 pages and 1,000 mentionings of hydrogen unexpectedly, but it's a lot. 
and the decarbonized gases and hydrogen package now in December. Uh, and you guys in ITRA committee uh, will have to deal with it. Jens is also uh, part of the, uh, is also member in the ITRA committee uh, and he represents the second biggest group in the European Parliament, the group of social, uh, the social democratic group, SPE. Uh, so Jens, Gaia, you have the floor for your statement. Yes, uh, thank you, Jorgo. Thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, um, after after uh, Max Pieper has has given his uh, um, statement, which I share to to a very large extent, there is not so much to add. I have to say. I mean, we all know about um, um, the the important role that hydrogen can play in. Uh, decarbonization of the of the society of uh, of transport of industry uh, especially of uh, um, heating and cooling um, and given the huge leverage that hydrogen can offer in bringing down uh, the industrial co2 emission I am um, mm, coming from the industrial heart, the old industrial heart of Germany, from the rural area in Nordrhein Westfalen, are very much interested in, in this aspect. And if there is a contradiction between Markus Pieper and me, it is probably here, because I would very much like to see, um, due to the huge leverage that we have, um, that uh, green hydrogen is especially, not exclusively, but especially uh, uh, used in the energy uh, intensive industry. So what, what I'm what I'm talking about, uh, think of uh, steel. Um, uh, for for example, Yogo, I know very well. You're born in Duisburg. What is still the place with the biggest steel mill in Europe? And um, this enterprise that runs the steel mill is uh, uh, facing huge um, investments this spring because they want to exchange uh, the, the furnaces that they have uh, actually by direct, uh, um, uh, di direct reducing installations. Um, this direct reduction installations combined with, uh, with green hydrogen produces green steel. So the CO2 free steel production in Europe is only, only, one investment uh, ahead of us, um, but we have to think about um, two things. We have to think about how do we get the huge amounts of green hydrogen that are needed, and how do we support these investments? Um, and uh, when I look at that, and if I compare that with, uh, um, with the uh, uh, delegated uh, um, regulation that we got from the from the commission or that was announced by the commission i think that um without without purpose of course um commission is is building up obstacles rather than opening perspectives for for, for such an investment additionality seems to be one of these obstacles um looking at the um situation that would be caused by the additionality here and the large amount of needed dry uh, of, of needed green uh, hydrogen over there, it looks to me like a discrimination uh, instead of opening avenues uh, for for the the uh, immediate production of green hydrogen. Um, this is another another aspect is how do we. Um, how do we give some incentives for producing green hydrogen after all? Um, when, we, when we look at the um, production size of renewable energy today, um, we, we see uh, that is, this is not a balanced situation in Europe. We have member states going very much ahead. We have others with high potential. In fact, every member state has some potential, but uh, other member states have has been reluctant uh, for 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 different reasons. But since 
each of these member states has committed to Paris. And each member state should look for fossil free, fossil free uh, uh, energy supply in the near future and possibly uh, new um, business cases for this new energy um, supply. We, I could see um, uh, the possibility of um, exporting renewable um, hydrogen from, from member states who have not so much invested in uh, uh, renewable energy up to now. What would Europe be more resilient and independent? We will never be independent uh, totally, given the huge amount of energy needed. Uh, but the more we can produce inside the EU, the better for us. And um, also here, I think the proposal of the of the uh, European Commission is is not very helpful. Thirdly, Max Pieper already mentioned about the time frame. I mean, who needs this huge amount of information? How the hydrogen uh, is produced with which means of energy on uh, an hourly base? I mean, an hour is almost is, is already better than uh, 15 minutes. What we had in a, in a further um, further. Uh, paper by the Commission, but who needs this information? What is it for? Which disadvantage is mitigated by this huge amount of information? How we can how we can control it? What does it help? I mean, um, weather changes from time to time, yes, but maybe over a day or over a week um, in, in 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 huge uh, uh, in, in, in some some areas or some uh, times of the year. But who needs this information every hour? I don't. I don't see that. And given all that together, I think we are missing a chance of enterprises immediately investing in green energy and green hydrogen now, and uh, building up not needed obstacles in case of uh, opening opening the avenues. Uh, for more renewables and green hydrogen. That's my short remark on what we have on the table. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Jens. Uh, remarkable because you, um, uh, I think both uh, Markus uh, and yourself, you have a clear view uh, on this uh, delegated act, uh, which is uh, obviously uh, important to a lot of stakeholders uh, and uh, um, I would like to thank you very much. Uh, I know that you have the voting in the, in the ITRI committee uh, right now, but it's, it was good to get uh, a clear view of how uh, you in the parliament see that uh, out of the perspective of the strategy and implementing the hydrogen strategy, but also out of the perspective of uh, Markus, who is working, you all are working, but he as a rapporteur, he's responsible uh, for the legislative framework that needs to be built now in order uh, to reach these targets. Now, the guy who's responsible at the commission uh, for these targets and uh, the guy who really, really uh, wants to look into it uh, is today with us. Um, so um, it's uh, Ruud Kempener. So he uh, is in that special period of uh, the uh, presentation uh, of RED2 back in July last year, and now of the implementation uh, and the co-legislation with Parliament and Council. Um, and he's uh, supporting, uh, as far uh, as I have heard, uh, the Commissioner personally also uh, on, on this uh, issue, and is really, really looking how can we implement the targets. So he will be on our panel today, he will be the first speaker. Um, um, he uh, is also uh, an expert in, in that field, so he has worked uh, in um, the energy field himself uh, in his previous life. Um, and we then, uh, I'll go, uh, I come to the speakers uh, and their bio later on, but we also have uh, Dr. Sopna Suri, uh, who is the Chief Operating Officer uh, uh, for Hydrogen at RWE Generation. Um, we have uh, and she will speak for investors, second biggest in renewables, I think, uh, globally. Then we also will see 
uh, how um, the private investors see it. The Marguerite Fund in Luxembourg uh, is specialized in energy and uh, we have Guillaume Rivron. And uh, we, last but not least, we have uh, Professor Art van Wijk, uh, who is a, a distinguished expert in hydrogen, but also in water uh, uh, and energy management. Um, and we start with Ruud. Uh, Ruud, you have seen uh, these um, clear um, statements. Uh, I saw very clearly, uh, I refer to what Marcus said, um, Paris is the benchmark. Let the industry come up with the best results. I remember Jens saying hydrogen is discriminated when looking at the uh, delegated act. Um, you have heard all the questions that the parliamentarians uh, have put on the table. Uh, I would li now like to turn to you because there's nobody in the whole commission who really looks at these targets what can help to achieve the targets? What can hamper? So you are the best to give us an answer. Ruth, you have the floor and thanks for joining. And thank you very much for, for in, inviting me today. Uh, and, and, and it's a privilege to be here. Um, also because of course, when the European Commission puts forward proposals, we have to justify why, why we're doing it. Uh, and, and indeed a lot of the, the, the work which we're doing is actually in the kind of, uh, uh, impact assessments of, of our proposals. So I think I can be able to respond not to all questions because we don't have a lot of time for that, but I think to the main questions in, in three points. Uh, and those three points is kind of, what is the intervention logic of the new proposals which the European Commission has put on the table to support the uptake of hydrogen? And I would say there are three elements there. Um, the first intervent intervention logic is that uh, we've heard since the uh, introduction of the European hydrogen strategy that there has been a, there is a chicken and egg problem. How, are we, how can we incentivize producers to start producing hydrogen if there is no demand yet? And how can consumers start consuming hydrogen if there's no production yet? And this is the first intervention log logic of our proposal. What we do is we put forward uh, targets for the uptake of hydrogen in 2030. So not today, not tomorrow, but in 2030, giving the industry, the producing side of the industry, eight years time to develop those volumes. It gives a certainty that the volumes is there. And at the same time, the consumers can start investing in the, uh, uh, the, the technologies uh, that can deliver on the hydrogen. That's the first intervention logic. The second intervention logic is why have we put in place specific targets for industry and target, uh, sorry, industry and transport. The reason that we've proposed specific targets for industry and transport is that in those two sectors, there are specific applications which needs investments in this decade. Like we've heard before in the introduction, if you wanna convert a steel plant in, in, into a production process that needs hydrogen, you do this once and that plant will be there for 20, uh, in 2050. So we would wanna make sure that any investments which are taking place in dec this decade are, enabling, are enabled by the availability of that hydrogen uh, in, in 2030. The same for the transport sector. Uh, we've heard from especially the maritime sector that they're looking and replacing their big ships. We wanna make sure that they can make the investments in those ships that run, for example, on hydrogen or hydrogen-based fuels this decade so that they are there for the, the next uh, 20, 30 years. So that's the second intervention logic. Now, the third intervention logic has to do indeed with what you just referred to, Yorgo, as the Paris uh, uh, targets. What we wanna make sure is to decarbonize a full energy system. And for that, we need a lot of energy efficiency investments, a lot of investments in renewables, a lot of investments in electrification, and a lot of investments in hydrogen. And this all needs to be done at the same time. So what we're proposing and, and putting forward is not only the targets 
for hydrogen in those specific energy sectors. But this comes with a full package also in terms of the recovery funds uh, availability to make those investments happen. And I think those three elements are putting together are answering a lot of the questions which we heard uh, uh, in, in, in the beginning on why we have uh, as a whole this intervention logic and the proposals on the table for the European Commission. And of course, an important element linked to that is indeed this delegated act. Now, the delegated act is, of course, part of the existing piece of legislation, which is in the Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, and here, the European Commission is not inventing something new, but we are uh, putting in place the requirements which have been, uh, which the co-legislators have put in place uh, in 2018. Uh, now, of course, with uh, hydrogen uh, being so prominent, what we want to make sure is that we accompanying the hydrogen with the renewables, the cheap renewables, not just renewables, the cheap renewables that we want uh, and that we need uh, to make uh, the production of renewable hydrogen happen. Uh, and with that, I think I want to add one more detailed element to this whole discussion. And I also saw this as one of the questions which came up about why, for example, uh, uh, a country like Sweden, which has a very high share of renewable electricity in its system and a very low CO2 intensity of its grid, why hyd the hydrogen cannot produce simply from the grid. And I think that's sometimes uh, what is forgotten in the whole discussion. Uh, and that is that, of course, already today, uh, in some member states which have a low uh, CO2 content of the grid, you can already start producing hydrogen, renewable hydrogen from the grid. However, of course, no of the, none of those countries has 100% renewable hydrogen. So the delegated act is really about what do you do with that hydrogen which you haven't, which is not renewable hydrogen yet. And there, indeed, the, uh, the elements of additionality are kicking in. And that's indeed which will be put on the table very, very shortly. Many thanks, Ruth. Um, that's clear. So we now understood uh, the intervention logic. We also know that um, 2018, basically, the co-legislators, uh, Council and Parliament, delegated to you that power. Um, the question now will be, and uh, happy to discuss that now with uh, the other panelists, why exactly it's only hydrogen that needs to be hit. So Jens called it a discrimination. Um, why it's not um, on equal footing with, with other uh, technologies. Uh, you mentioned yourself uh, the different technologies. One of the biggest investors in, in that field is indeed uh, RWE, um, turning more and more into a, a big renewable uh, company. And um, Sopna Suri, who is uh, indeed the chief operating officer, uh, joined the board of uh, RWE in February uh, last year. So she's responsible for the coordination of the hydrogen activities at RWE. So lots of, uh, lots of decisions that you need to take, Sopna. Uh, quite some capital that you have in order to invest. What will be your decision uh, based on uh, the delegated act that we all know? Sopna, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much, Yogor. And also thank you for being on it uh, and giving me the possibility of actually contributing today. So I think very simple, there's a short answer. And I'm actually very happy having listened to Marcus P. Penny and Skaya beforehand, because indeed it's not really a make or break point for Europe. And if you ask us, what are we going to do as RWE? I mean, obviously we are running a portfolio of projects, not only limited to a market, but we are spread at least in terms of the European Union um, across the Netherlands and Germany, but we're also having a position in the UK. And I think the point of the main question for us really is, do we as Europe really want to enable decarbonization? I think the intention is very clear. There's no mistake in, um, to be taken about it. There is consensus about climate neutrality has to be reached. But are we really serious? Or are we actually also simply willing to accept a certain degree of deindustrialization in Europe. And this is going to happen. We are just at the brim of not only losing, I would say, large volumes in terms of supply chain and 
localized industrial jobs with such strict criteria around green hydrogen. But it's also about the associated, let me call it welfare, that is really at risk. Not even wanting to talk about that this is a unique opportunity of really taking up international global technology leadership if it comes to the OEMs, to the suppliers of technology. All these topics require to have visibility. And frankly speaking, I understand the Commission's intention to sign, yes, by 2030, we want to kind of have a ramp up and people have time and industry can actually adjust. Reality is industry has to take investments decisions today. This is on the one hand, the partners and customers I'm talking to every day because they are not only asking me, okay, what type of volume in which quality do I potentially get where in 2030? They need to understand the real ramp up starting actually one or two years from now. And in order to actually serve this, they have to now really do massive investments. But who is going to make an investment if there's no clarity? And on the other hand, Jorgo, you are asking, how are we looking at it? I mean, we are um, just about further developing and really very strongly pushing forward one of our flagship projects here in Lingen, Get H2, with a lot of partners. So we are aiming at having 300 megawatt by 2026 to actually cater to the industry. But I mean, those commitments can only be possible if green power electricity can be actually used, if there's more relaxation in terms of using also existing assets, because again, reality bites. Renewable plants are not bring, are not be able to be brought online within one or two years. That's just naive thinking. Yeah, it takes, particularly if you think about the mainland of Europe in terms of onshore currently six to seven years, and offshore wind takes even up to 10 years of development timelines. So my simple point is, if we're serious in Europe, um, I would really pledge the European Commission to stick to their intention, but also making it possible to achieve it. Yeah, we all want to run for the Olympics, but if you tie all our legs, investors like RWE and also in the industry, they won't be able actually to deliver against it. And I think that's going to be a massive, massive problem for Europe. Um, I, I think, Ruth, you should be given the, the opportunity in the end to, to also uh, respond, because I think uh, it's, it's quite uh, important what we just uh, heard. So massive investment needed. I think this is a clear message. Ruth said already, Hydrogen has access to the full package of funds, which is great news, uh, uh, by the way, uh, because the public funds will leverage um, the the private investment uh, to a high extent. So that's that's imp very important. But then Sopna used a word, um, she said naive thinking, uh, which is, I think, important in that context, because we have seen that, uh, and I turn to Guillaume now, to our next speaker, we have seen that in another field, like photovoltaic industry, it was the Europeans who started a development, but they lost the industry. Uh, and uh, this is a, a massive loss of, of jobs, of uh, opportunities. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure whether we risk uh, the same here in hydrogen, but some people say it seems that we go into that direction. I'm uh, looking forward now to the contribution of Guillaume Rivron, uh, who is uh, a partner at the Marguerite Fund in Luxembourg. Uh, Guillaume will present a little bit uh, himself what the fund is doing but you're very much connected of course to our to the biggest investment bank of the world to a certain extent that's the european investment bank uh, you are based in in luxembourg um, where the bank also is um, guillaume is a former business development director at global Egg, but he is also a former manager at edf in france uh, and uh, he did uh, hold positions in different um, positions in, in business units uh, so you know the energy world very, very well. What is the perspective of you guys sitting on quite some funds, private funds, that over the last years and also waiting for taxonomy, waiting for uh, today uh, taxonomy uh, saw the light, um, officially the light of the world, so on, on sustainable and climate-friendly investment. So all your partners and customers were waiting for these signals. What's your take on RED2, the targets, and also on this delegated act? I think that's important for, 
for Ruud and his colleagues uh, also to know. Uh, Guillaume, you have the floor. Thanks, Yogo, and, and, and thanks uh, for kindly uh, inviting uh, inviting me to speak today. Look, I mean, just a few things. So, I mean, we are by design, uh, Margaret, uh, investing in greenfield in Europe. I mean, our LPs are effectively, you know, part of the different countries. So we strive for new development. Uh, we've been around the first uh, financial investors to, to go into offshore wind, um, uh, then amongst the first to go in FTTH. And frankly, we'd like to be amongst the first to go into hydrogen. Problem is that we only invest in Europe. So we have to focus on Europe. And this is where, you know, I've been looking at this for two years now, looking at the development of the different strategies, European strategies. I was getting more and more excited by the fact that Europe wanted to be at the forefront. And then came the Delected Act. And then I said, sorry, I mean, um, the ambition is high. And I'm so proud of this ambition because it's a global market. You know, these are not electrons, these are molecules. By definition, uh, it's a global market, okay? Which means interconnection is key, which means the, the, the race is on, right? And, and, and I feel like the souffle effect, you know, I'm French. So, you know, we've, we've, we've basically pushed the whole thing. And now we're like, you know what? We'll make your life hell, you developers, you investors. Because actually, I'm, I'm afraid to say that it's just not working. I mean, what you've put, at least on what I see today, uh, is not working. I mean... Uh, the, the, the complexity of the electricity system is growing exponentially, and we need to know each hour whether the price will be this or that in that country or that country. I mean, no, no model in the world can do that. Um, the European Union and the electricity system, this is where I come from, I'm an electricity guy initially, and I moved into other things like molecules, is built on interconnection. It's built on the fact that it doesn't matter where production and demand is, we, we'll make it flow, right? And here we are putting constraints and we say, we actually want to be small. So, I mean, hydrogen to strive has to reach scale and quickly. And what we're designing through this act is little things. We won't achieve scale. You know, the, 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 the truth of the matter, when you look at projects, which is what we do every day, is that, you know, production happens typically in one place and demand of hydrogen happens elsewhere. So you need to be able to make that flow. And actually we're very good in Europe because we have networks and we know how to manage the molecules from one point to the other. So putting constraints on, you know, temporal constraints and geographical constraints is just killing a, a nascent sectors today. And, and, and when you look at the people with whom we're trying to develop projects, you know, those developers, small developers, large utilities, companies like RWE here, I mean, they have the pressure to basically deliver the green, uh, the green deal, the green agenda. They all believe, as you do, that you know, we need to decarbonize, but it's not one versus the other. We don't have to oppose decarbonization of the electricity mix, which is everybody agrees with that, with decarbonization of the industry, which I think everybody agrees can only be done, especially the hard to abate, through hydrogen. So why opposing one with the other? We need to reach pace and speed at the same time. Yes, what it means is that you won't necessarily be able to be fully green today, but you know, in energy transition, there was the word transition. For many reasons, a number of countries have not been blessed or have chosen in the past, not necessarily the best solutions to have a good renewable generation mix in the system. Why should they be penalized? Why can't we, you know, when you're in Poland, where you don't necessarily have all it takes to, to basically produce locally today, because you've got still a number of other sources, be supported truly to be, build scalable hydrogen project by using energy from Portugal or from Spain or what have you. So really, I mean, the, the, the message here is that the world is watching. It is a global race. I thought we were good on the starting block, but suddenly, you know, with all the other guys about to race, you, you're just putting, and we still have time to take it off, a huge weight. We cannot win the race with weight on our shoulders, you know? So, I mean, please, let's, let's, let's all work in the same direction, which is to decarbonize, but let's not say that one has to come before the other. Decarbonization of the industry through hydrogen has to happen at the same time in parallel as decarbonization from the electricity grid. And the real topics are not to 
punish the hydrogen sector. And frankly, I'm neutral. I could invest elsewhere. Actually, today, I will have to invest elsewhere because I cannot put money at work in this sector. But you know, let's focus on giving targets for countries and not on projects. Let's focus on enabling the thematic of renew renewables, which is really difficult. Let's focus on you know, supporting the grid operators so that they can, they can connect faster. But net, net, let's not have as a culprit the hydrogen I think they deserve it. They're trying to, to, to grow. And, uh, and, and you know, this is sending the wrong message. Many, merci beaucoup. Many thanks, um, Guillaume. Clear language, I have to say. Global race and how can Europeans then participate being in a pool position. Huh? So I, I uh, reiterate what uh, Markus Pieper said at the very beginning. We are at a pool position. Jens Geier said, we started first with a big strategy and now we are putting weight on our shoulders and uh, let the global uh, spectators watch us <laughs> trying to run with this weight on our shoulders. Clear words. Let's uh, now turn, I, I, Ruth, you will, you will get the, the opportunity, of course, to respond uh, to all that. Uh, but let's now turn to uh, Professor Art van Wyk, uh, who has, uh, is the co-author of the two times 40 gigawatt uh, strategy and initiative, which was at the, one of the basis, one of the uh, kick-starting points of uh, uh, also the EU uh, hydrogen strategy. Uh, Art, you have an idea how you can put into practice additionality because that is basically the target that the commission has to fulfill uh, based on what the legislator 2018 said, additionality, but with a much less uh, bureaucratic uh, principle. Can you explain yeah. to us, we, you have one slide that explains also, and we will show the slide now, why this is a clear discrimination towards other technologies. Please, Art, you have the yes. floor. Yes, thank you, Yorgo. Um, yes, the concept uh, of the Delegated Act uh, describes, of course, uh, which uh, hydrogen qualifies as uh, green hydrogen. Uh, and uh, what you will see that doesn't work in practice for many of, of the smaller projects that are emerging to, today. And uh, let me try to explain that from, the, from a very, very practical uh, project where we work on. And you see here a company, uh, a contractor and groundworks company, your Scholman, and they have dozens of tractors, cranes, shovels, and, and placeholders for work, like constructing uh, sports fields, roads, preparing construction sites, etc., etc. This company uses 2 million liters of diesel per year. And they have to they subscribe to tenders from municipalities and public bodies, which ask for zero emissions. In the past, they have briefly tried to realize this with electric, uh, electrically driven uh, machines uh, with batteries. But it shows out this is practically impossible. It, uh, the battery pack is too heavy, too small uh, in, in energy and too large in charging times. And therefore, they know that their solution is hydrogen. And therefore, they have developed already with New Holland, a tractor company, dual fuel tractors, where they can uh, inject 60 to 80% uh, of the, uh, of uh, replace uh, the diesel by hydrogen by injecting it into the air inlet of the diesel engine. And they have converted already 10 of these tractors in dual fuel tractors, but also they are now converting their cranes into uh, hydrogen fuel cell uh, uh, driven uh, cranes, uh, uh, electric cranes, you have to say. Um, in October 2021, they opened their uh, hydrogen refueling station at their premises, as you can uh, see, but they now uh, tube in the hydrogen via tube trailers, and, and this is really gray hydrogen. And therefore, they want to install an electrolyzer, uh, near, you can see that in the middle, uh, next to two solar farms and produce uh, electricity, uh, uh, produce green hydrogen by uh, buying electricity uh, from an electricity company with a purchase agreement, hey? buying green electricity, of course. Uh, but if you look to this, uh, then uh, 
if they buy this uh, and the concept of this delegated act will work, then they have to install new capacity uh, for uh, renewables, not the existing solar farms. And it has to match every hour. Yeah, then this doesn't qualify as uh, green hydrogen in this case. And therefore they, they don't produce green hydrogen, cannot uh, apply for these uh, contracts where they offer uh, zero emission. Uh, for example, but if they have done this with a battery electric uh, vehicles, uh, machines, which is not possible, then it would qualify as green. Yeah, that's strange, weird, you could say, and uh, indeed discriminating uh, the one green solution to the other green solution, which is not possible in this case. And this is not only for this company, but we see it with bakeries, with glass manufacturers, with all kinds of applications where they want to go to green uh, uh, and also it is not possible or uh, uh, impossible or at high cost to do that with, uh, with electricity. This is really the case when you uh, do the additionality and also the hourly match between uh, uh, electricity production, green electricity production and hydrogen production. So what you have to do is the same as what you have to do for green electricity. It is really uh, buying green electricity from an uh, electricity company with green certificates or whatever way you want to prove that it is green. And then you can produce, of course, a green uh, hydrogen with these devices. Uh, the fundamental flaw is that you ask for additionality uh, and this uh, hourly match to the customers of electricity. That's not what you have to do. You have, to, of course, uh, in the electricity system, you can require, uh, of course, uh, the, that there is a certain percentage of green uh, electricity in the system, but that is at the electricity companies they have to to do this, you don't impose that to the customers of, uh, of electricity in this case. And of course, when you go by larger projects in the future, when there is a hydrogen pipeline system, then you can also supply the hydrogen by a pipeline to the system. But for the moment, we don't have this in place. So this is not helpful in developing uh, the, uh, the, yeah, the say the, the green hydrogen production by electrolyzers and using the electricity, it is uh, hampering it. And therefore I think the only reasonable thing is maybe up to a certain uh, uh, a megawatt uh, 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 range that you say, okay, it is green hydrogen if you buy green electricity from the grid. And that's, I think the most uh, simple and wise thing to do uh, for this moment when we are still in the emerging phase of developing a green hydrogen uh, system or a hydrogen system in, in Europe. Uh, thank you. Many thanks, uh, Professor Art van Wyk. Very clear uh, position also. Um, I think, uh, Sopna, you were not done uh, previously, so I would like to come back to you and uh, comment also after your comment uh, uh, also on Art van Wyk's uh, 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 positioning here. And of course, give Ruud the floor so he can answer some questions or give his impression. Sopna, please take the floor. Yeah, thank you, Ogo. Um, so, I mean, also now listening to Art van Wyk, I think you're perfectly right. First of all, why do we want to discriminate green hydrogen as opposed to other technologies in Europe? Why do we want to discriminate certain member states in Europe because of their legacy and geographic capability as opposed to other member states in Europe? I think there is consensus we need to have as quick as possible the largest volume of hydrogen being in the system. So there shouldn't be either any discrimination between smaller and large scale projects. It doesn't make sense, yeah? The more criteria we invent, the more difficult it gets. So let me just now get one more time, even really very much concrete. Um, for the delegated act, um, I think in order to be really pragmatic, let's rather look for the biggest solution sites. So meaning concretely, first of all, rather having an annual temporal correlation, because come on, the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. We know we have, we know it, yeah? As a renewables operator, there are seasonal effects. And the tighter you drive the correlation, the more expensive 
the actual produced hydrogen gets. So it's getting even more difficult for the off-taker, for the industry to even cover their cost. So this can't be the right way. So make it as um, broad as possible. Second, and I think um, Guillaume, you also mentioned it, it's about geography. Um, given that I think we and Europe, we are working as a team. So let's also play it as a team. And yes, use, let's use PPAs, let's use GOOs to making sure we can actually procure the electricity to fuel the green hydrogen, but not again put it into, it has to be in the same bidding zone, into the same market. This doesn't help. The only thing it does, it simply limits the accessible volume. Hence, it reduces the available green hydrogen in the system. Hence, it simply does not make it possible for the industry to decarbonize. Um, thirdly, the topic about are we waiting for new builds? I think it would be very easy to simply oblige the national member states to increase their renewables targets. They should have the obligation from a systems perspective to really drive the fast build out of renewables. Why would we want to penalize the hydrogen producer? That doesn't make sense either. Yeah, you need to have a top down approach and then you're still getting to additionality, but you're still allowing the projects to really taking off. Infrastructure was also mentioned. I know this is about um, Red Team and the Delegated Act today, but let's not um, forget we need to have an infrastructure that is again enabled. Topics like in the gas package about very strict unbundling rules. I think I'm just wondering is this the best way of giving planning certainty, of also making sure there's an incentive for companies, for the grid operators to really repurpose and convert. Why is there even a separate regulation thought between hydrogen and gas? It is a gas, come on, it is a gas, it is a molecule, yeah? So let's just rather be pragmatic here and again also reconsider that point. And um, I would say last but not least, um, if we really wanna have renewables build out as quickly as possible, it would be fantastic if the European Commission can help by further also obliging member states to, I would say, facilitate and speed up permitting, because that's again an important enabler, yeah? A target is good, but make sure people have the instruments. And if you put all these ingredients as pragmatically as possible together, then I think we can have the lowest green hydrogen at the largest volume come to the market in Europe and also secure our welfare state and the industrial, industrial base. And I think that would just be my plea um, from an investor's perspective route. Thank you, Georg, for just giving me the chance for sharing those comments. Ma ma many thanks also for, for clarifying uh, uh, on this uh, last element on permitting. Uh, I think here we are absolutely on the side on, on our renewable friends, uh, because we know that especially uh, wind, but also solar, especially wind, needs a faster permitting uh, procedure. Uh, and here we are absolutely uh, at their side. Uh, and this is for me, uh, before I give the floor to Rude, also to clarify, Hydrogen Europe is not against additionality. We are all in favor of it. The question is who should be, you know, the one to prove the additionality. Um, Sopna mentioned, should it be the projects? Uh, Art van Weyck said, should it be the clients of the, uh, of the electricity to prove it? Or should it be the member states who have the best possibilities to do so and, uh, and they should uh, do it? Um, Ruth, what can I say people who say, who tell me, listen, there, is so many, uh, there are so many uh, people referring to greenwashing that what happens here is blackwashing. Uh, I think um, that what has been said in the beginning uh, also by Markus Pieper, an old wind park uh, under the current scheme of the delegated act, an old wind park, which is out of uh, the subsidy scheme, could never ever be the source, although it's fully renewable, the source of green hydrogen under the scheme, because it's, it's not foreseen. That's blackwashing and that's discriminating. So what do I tell these people uh, in order to avoid saying that? Ruth, you have the, so to say, the, the final uh, floor. And thank you very much uh, uh, for that. Um, having, having listened to all of the comments, and I, I don't know, this is all my notes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually going to say, I'm, I'm not, uh, from, a, from a commission perspective, again, um, seeing big disagreements. I see a different view on how to achieve the same objectives. 
And I'm going to try to, again, try to put that in, 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 a, in, a, in a couple of elements. And first, I, I find it interesting to, to kind of get feedback which, which um, assumes that there is a discrimination or uh, that hydrogen is opposed to other, other sources. And let me give that with a very specific example. If we look, and uh, I'm sure Guillaume and Sopna have done this as well, if you look at the investments needed, for example, to get to the 40 gigawatts of electrolyzers in 2030. Now, roughly speaking, we need 40 billion euros of investments in the electrolyzers, but we need 200 billion euros of investments in renewables to get that to happen. Uh, and those renewables need to be cheap. We can't run an electrolyzer on uh, an electricity price or renewable electricity price of more than five, six euros per megawatt hours. No, we need the cheap renewable electricity to make those electrolyzers economically feasible. So there's no opposition in my opinion there. Hydrogen needs to come with cheap renewables and together that as a package as a whole can make us again ensure that those industries which need that hydrogen get that at a cost competitive price. And I think that's essentially also the intention of the policy package what the European Commission has put in place, ensuring that those, those come, come together. The other element, which I uh, also heard at the beginning also from our uh, uh, distinguished members of the European Parliament, uh, we have over the last decades worked really hard on a European market, uh, uh, both on the electricity and on the gas market, and we should be really proud of that. This is something which no other country or region has. If you look at the data, almost all, uh, it's almost all EU member states which are leading in terms of the integration of variable renewables like solar and wind into the electricity system. So we are already showing and having a position here where we're way advanced of other countries which have like 5% of solar and wind in their electricity system. This is all happening in Europe. So we have to take advantage of that uh, 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 development. And here in Europe, we get year by year about 40 gigawatts of renewables into the system. Uh, take this forward over the next two, eight, eight years, there's about 500 gigawatts of new renewables coming into the system. I think that should be a sufficient pool of new projects which we wanna drive uh, that will be enabled to, to, to power that 40 gigawatts or 50 gigawatts of electrolyzers. Uh, those renewables are coming into the project. So if someone says, okay, we're waiting for a project, well, every single year, those renewables are coming into the project and we wanna have them as cheap as possible coming into the project so that they create the pool for the electrolyzers to run. And, and that also comes to the point of molecules. Indeed, we're on one of the, 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 the regions which has both a very comprehensive electricity market and a very comprehensive molecules market. So we wanna take advantage of that. And that again, where some of those, those, those geographical uh, correlations come from, making sure that we get the cheap renewables, which are in, in, in certain places of Europe, converting them into the molecules and getting those molecules to, to where we need it. So again, I don't see uh, uh, any opposing views there, but really actually more of, a, 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 of synergies between what we heard today and what the European Commission is proposing. This also relates to this idea of temporal correlation. Um, I used to work at a, at a big chemical company in the refinery. Uh, and it's to no surprise, I guess, that you're running your electrolyzer looking at every five minutes what the electricity price is or 15 minutes. This is what you do. Huh? And this is what we do in Europe and we do it very, very well. And if we want to have an integrated energy system, which is completely decarbonized, we are all, and we are doing this already very well, looking at a much more uh, 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 granular level on how to match demand and supply, whether it's electricity, whether it's molecules, whether it's other forms uh, of renewables. This is just what is, going to, what is already happening today. And I don't see, again, any disagreement between what we've heard today and what is, uh, what is, what is being proposed in the, in, in the commission. Uh, proposals which are put forward. Then I just wanted to add like one last, two last things in terms of in terms of cl clarity. Um, the targets which are being put forward by the European Commission, they are at member state level. 
Um, so they're not at project level. So we're really looking here at, okay, how at a member state level can we ensure that 50% of that hydrogen and industry comes from renewable resources? And we obviously understand that not every single project needs 50% uh, of its hydrogen coming from renewables. And then the other element, which I also already alluded to uh, in the beginning, which is that the delegated act on hydrogen is not the only way you can produce renewable hydrogen. You can also produce renewable hydrogen from the grid, uh, and that will become increasingly important as the CO2 intensity of that grid is reducing and the share of renewables in that grid is increasing. So if you have a country, like I said, with Sweden, which has all of those already wind turbines and, and hydropower in place, then you can already use that grid. And that balance between using the grid at those places where it is already green and where you can take advantage of the existing uh, renewables vis-a-vis -vis those places where you need to add more renewables to make it green, that balance will, of course, shift over time. Uh, and what we're doing now in the period up to 2030 is to make sure that that shift uh, goes as quickly as possible such that we can use uh, our grids more and more to produce the renewable hydrogen. So uh, many, many, many thanks. Uh, there are still many, many people in the, the audience. And can I give you all one sentence to respond possibly to, to Rüd? Uh, Sopna, you, you, you are the first because you also have to leave. Uh, and then possibly Guillaume uh, and uh, Art. Yeah, thanks, Diogo. So actually, Rüd, I fully disagree. Um, I don't see any synergies and I don't see any consensus here in terms of instruments. I think the arguments you've been lying down, I, I, I get where you're coming from. But again, the point is only a big solution spice, big pragmatism, working across the European member states can actually solve the green hydrogen problem. The more strictly get on criteria, the more theoretical and academic it gets, and basically, it will simply not make any hydrogen economy in Europe fly. And I'm very happy if there's any chance of also bilaterally engage. I'm more than happy to exchange more arguments um, because I see the, the challenges the Commission might be in, but I think that's not the right way forward. Thank you, everybody. I'm very sorry I need to leave now. Many thanks. Clear, clear language. Uh, Guillaume. Yes, thank you. Um, I would say too that devil is in the details, uh, root, and and actually uh, in some of implementing uh, what is in the in the DA today uh, is just not working, right? Um, so um, you know there, there are lots of ideas which can be taken and, and put more pragmatic, but you need to give more room for the markets to decide, uh, because at the end of the day, you know if if, if as anything, uh, the market is the ultimate um, you know uh, decision maker on that, I think, and, uh, and 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 if that doesn't happen, unfortunately, uh, people will build hydrogen projects, but not in Europe. Very and I'm clear. happy to collaborate to uh, off uh, very much, you know, looking forward to support you because I know it's difficult. So, Well, Marguerite is the private arm, if you wish, of the EIB. So uh, I think uh, you have a clear word to say here, uh, as this is uh, an important leverage. Art van Wyk, our professor. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Ruth, I see your uh, viewpoint that is, of course, high over uh, 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 energy uh, policy and also uh, uh, you're referring to large companies. But uh, this is really not working in, in practice if you do it uh, like this. I hope I have showed uh, the, you the example because at this uh, uh, refueling station, you can produce for about six euros per kilo if you don't have to transport it. Uh, and that is competitive, then you have about an, an electricity price of five, six cents per kilowatt hour. This is competitive. But it is not competitive if you uh, have to uh, do the hourly matching, for example, or only rely on the, uh, on the grid mix, because then you have to install large quantities of, uh, of, of storage systems. So from a general viewpoint, I can follow you, but it is not really in practice what you can do by stimulating this, uh, this renewable uh, and, and green hydrogen uh, production from these, uh, for these companies. And you see a lot of these projects now coming, but let me sell, say also, if this, if this will work out, 
then you will see that many of these companies now will withdraw and yeah then we have a much bigger problem and we will not uh, achieve any goal of the of the green deal uh, they, they become frustrated etc cetera, etc cetera. so please have a look also from the more practical side uh, what will work and uh, and also on the short notice and that's uh, hopefully uh, uh, that's my plea as i know how big the pressure is also on the commission on that because uh, it's not easy i mean uh, Ruth, you one sentence from your side or are you okay uh no the 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 only last thought which which i have indeed is that um <clears throat> I, I think again. I want to go back to 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 the to to the, to the principles, and e even with, for example, Professor von Wake, for, 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 for Professor von Wake's example, uh, what I what I what I want to see indeed is that th those projects are are, are happening uh, within Europe, and I think they can, uh, and I think also that we here play a leadership role internationally. And that I do think that what we were putting here forward in place is something which will last. It's not something which is now and is going to be changing in the next year. It is something that will last. And so the idea of, of, of industries leaving or something like that, I think that if we really put this forward, and I think we do have the most comprehensive framework anywhere in the world. Uh, I know there are examples of, of the US putting in place, but these are only bits and pieces of what we've put forward now as a whole. So if we put this whole comprehensive package as a whole forward at the European Union, we are the one which are going to lead this, this transition. I'm quite convinced of that. And, and that means that others will follow. So whatever we do, I believe in what those project developers and the innovators and the companies and the investors here in Europe can deliver. You're muted, Yogo. I'm allowed to say it now. <laughs> Thanks, sorry. That brings me back to what Sopna said earlier on. It's a team uh, that needs to win and let's work as a team. And I, I saw the readiness of, of the commission still to, to listen to uh, all these arguments. I'm fully aware of the, of the pressure, uh, but I'm also aware of the pressure lying on, on our industry. The expectation by electrolyzer companies or on electrolyzer companies are very, very high. But as you know, projects are not materializing because of the fear of this delegated act. This is something that people tell me every day from all parts of Europe. Um, this is something which is really, really serious. Ruud is absolutely uh, correct saying this very comprehensive framework that we got with Fit for 55 and the hydrogen package is unique in the world, is absolutely unique. But sometimes you have one of these small factors that can make or break. And the delegated act is this small little factor that uh, makes the make or break. I have to thank you. The audience stayed uh, with us uh, until now. We are uh, some minutes uh, over time. So thanks very much to all of you um, to uh, join this uh, webinar. Uh, this hydrogen talks. Uh, thanks very much also uh, to give your ideas. Uh, thanks for the open words. Uh, thanks uh, to Jens uh, Geier, uh, who stayed uh, until now to also assess what is going on. Thanks to the rapporteur, to Markus Pieper, who uh, made also a clear statement. And uh, I'm sure that the, the way we deal with this delegated act will have also uh, some influence on delegated acts in the future. Thanks very much indeed. Have a good time. Let's stay constructive as a team. Bye-bye.